diligence if I didn't uh, get online and start reading about what the latest advancements in science are. And I discovered some, you remember the scene where uh, Wilford Brimley is like, he's got his yellow legal pad, he's kind of thinking, and then he's looking at the old school 1982 um, graphics of mm -hmm. what the thing, how it's going to replicate and spread. I wanted to do that, I wanted to do something that harkened back to that. So I discovered this company called Cepheid that, um, that, that has built what is called a molecular analyzer. And I had no idea that anything like this existed. It's about the size of a, uh, it was in the trailer. It's about the size of an old, uh, you know, computer stack. And um, what it does is it analyzes on a molecular level down to the DNA of, uh, you can put a sample in it and it can tell you uh, what species it came from, if it had a cold, if it had cancer. It's just a, an amazing piece of technology. And I was so impressed with it that I contacted the company and they're like, we love sci-fi horror movies. Are you kidding me? So uh, they, they were good enough to bring the machine down. It was like a $30,000 machine. Um, they schooled our actors on how to use it. That's and, cool. Uh, and it's in the movie. And uh, I'm, I'm kind of proud that we have that little connection with, uh, with real technology. And, um, anyway, uh, and the other, the other part of that is that uh, the, the science of the, of the tardigrades themselves. If you guys, I don't know, any of you watched Cosmos lately, the, the show Cosmos? Um, the tardigrades are tiny little resilient creatures. They, they're, they're probably the most resilient uh, creatures on Earth. They're, they're extremophiles, which means they can live in very hot and very cold um, temperatures. And uh, they've, they've used them in space. Uh, uh, you know, NASA sent them up, and, you know, all, uh, uh, and they've survived direct space radiation, all that stuff. So that's the other part of our, of our science in it, is that we're tapping into real life stuff, just to sort of root it in some kind of reality. And, and um, you know, after that, it's all just like, uh, you know, anything can happen. So that was our nice, uh, our nice little hook and excuse to get into the fun. So let's talk about some more fun. I would like to bring uh, our cast members and uh, Benjamin Brown on stage right now, if we could. Um, we have uh, our leads here. Camille Balsamo, who plays Sadie in the film. <laughs> Followed by Reed Collins, who plays Bowman. <laughs> and I'm sure you know Matt Winston, who's, who's, uh, who's, a, who's an actor in his own right and the, uh, the son of my mentor, Stan Winston. And there's Benjamin Brown. <laughs> ben is our DP and uh, editor and post-production supervisor. And if you, um, if you like the look of the film, and if you stick around, we'll get these lights turned off. I don't know if there's a, if there's a grown up here that can help us <laughs> with that. But uh, it's a very rich look, and Ben designed the lighting uh, uh, for it and, uh, and the look of it. And right now where we are is uh, we're in post-production, and um, we're into the, uh, the DI right now, which is where you play with all the it, it's almost like you're, you're shooting the movie again. You get an opportunity to do more things with it in terms of color timing and, and so on and so forth. So, um, uh, Matt, you do this all the time. What, should I open it up for questions or should I give it over to you guys to, to what's the deal? Well, typically you'd like the uh, actors to tell more about what their role is in the film, prepare oh. them, give a little overview and then go uh, Is that questions. right? Yeah, because oh. then they'll know what to ask about. Oh, okay, okay. Yeah. Well, that makes sense. He's smart. He's like his dad. He's smart. <laughs> if you see us, if you see a seven-foot-tall guy walk through the door in just a second, that's another one of our actors. Don't be afraid. Uh, Camille, why don't you tell us something about your character? Hello, everyone. I, I play Sadie Graff, uh, the granddaughter of Captain Graff, played by Lance Henriksen. I uh, grew up in Alaska, in and around my grandfather's uh, crabbing, crabbing ship. And, but I went away off to the big city to, to study marine biology, and I brought back a few later. I brought, a few years later, I brought back um, my professor and another one of my fellow grad students with me back onto the ship because I figured it was a great way to research the migration of beluga whales um, at at a, at a penny pinching. Um, Penny pinching cost. So we. So I think. It, I think it'll be great. Uh, we'll. We'll. There he is. There's Winston. Big applause for Winston Francis. Winston plays Big G, who's one of the crew. 
look at that. Jesus. <laughs> this is one of the crew members on the Harbinger. Teddy bear, don't be scared. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, so I so I bring I bring all my all my my colleagues on the ship, and uh, we pull something up because the whales are attracted to it. So we think it's probably important, and we pull it up, and it contains these mutated tardigrades, and they begin their part of the story. Well, you saw the trailer. <laughs> um, my name's Reed Collins. I play Bowman, and to piggyback off of what she was saying. I'm part of the crew, one of the crab fishermen. I had a beard, if you guys are like, who the hell is that? <laughs> um, and there's a really nice dynamic of a mixing of two worlds that don't really go together with the scientists and the students and the, and the crab fishermen, because we're sort of there to get work done. It's a dangerous job, and we aren't really informed that we're going to be taking uh, a group of grad students and, and their, their nutty professor out to uh, you know, do this, this separate study of, of beluga whales, so it, it, it's instantly a nice uh, dynamic on the ship that there's, there's tension between those two groups. Uh, I think perhaps I bridge the gap a little more because understandably I have a little bit of a crush on this one in the film, and uh, so I, I, I think maybe I'm a little bit of the bridge between the two, but I'm part of the crew, I'm, uh, I work under Lance, who's the captain of our ship. Uh, my character is Stephen Lichty, the professor uh, of Camille's character, and Giovanni who's not here, and uh, definitely a fish out of water, all these, you know, bearded, real men, and I come in all buttoned down and probably more comfortable in a lecture hall than the Bering Sea. And uh, I do think I'm the only voice of reason in this film, I'll be honest with you, <laughs> surrounded by a pack of idiots. And, uh, and it turns out to be, I was correct. And, uh, most everyone dies. Uh, and if they listen to me, nothing bad would have happened. So, I am the central beating heart of this movie. Um, all right, this is Winston. I'm not the central beating heart, but I'm Winston. I'm in the movie, I'm Big G, and uh, I am uh, I'm the first mate on the ship. And uh, that's uh, Captain Graf, is my cat pop. He's like my grandfather, my father. He brought me onto the ship, and we're a big bunch of like, uh, I guess you call us like college kids at shore, you know, on sea, I mean. And uh, we get out there and usually do crabbing, but this time we had to end up doing something different and interesting. And as he said, we all end up. Yeah, this time we do surviving. I think we're more upset for that than we are at Yeah, I think we brought some <laughs> idiots on the boat. It's a problem. <laughs> <laughs> we were doing just fine what we normally do, crabs, right. eating crab all day. And Certainly nothing would have happened if this guy didn't show up, so. Certainly Not sure if he's the central. Stand up on here. Come on. Now. So that's why he's trying to make himself feel better, because he got us all killed. <laughs> It was her. She's the one who brought it on the... This is a story of Pandora and the box. And she's Pandora. And the tardigrades are the box. And not everyone dies. Not everyone. <laughs> so, so if you notice, just a comment about beards. Um, you know, we all love the beards and uh, Carpenter's the thing. So I wanted to make sure that um, our... Even though we have a, a more diverse uh, cast than, uh, than was in the thing, I want to make sure we have as many awesome beards as possible. Reed had one. We had... Uh, we have a guy playing an Inuit character who had an awesome beard. Of course, look at Winston's beard. You can't beat that. So. And you grew a beard during the shoot. I did grow a beard during <laughs> the shoot. Yeah. And there was a lot of faith involved because I had never grown a beard in my life. And this was the first you time. You came tell in full. I was very, I actually, very pleased. When I cast you, I actually asked you that. And you said, yes, it's, it's uh, overnight. I can grow a beard. There was, there was no auditioning. Alec just said, can you grow a good beard? <laughs> you I said, it's beautiful. Here it is. So uh, down at the end of the, uh, the row, we have Benjamin Brown, who's our DP. Um, one of the, one of the uh, interesting cast members of the film was the ship itself. When uh, Alec designed it, his first comment was he wanted to create a very claustrophobic effect for the entire film. So everything, as this man knows, had a seven-foot ceiling with pipes, so we have a lot of dents and smacks and scrapes on top of this guy all throughout the set. scars to prove it. But one of the things he, he wanted to create was that very claustrophobic effect, no matter how much it made the shooting nearly impossible. He insisted on making things as tightness. And so the ship itself became, and the set became a character within 
the uh, cast, which was kind of interesting to watch how they responded to scenarios where something just happened in front of you. Someone just morphed into a creature. Someone's about to die. And you can't run anywhere because you only have a 12 foot by 12 foot room. And where else are you going to go in the ship in the middle of the Bering Sea? You're not going to jump in the water. So Alex's design was really a, part of, a very large part of this character of the ship, which became an interesting member of the cast also with the uh, people here, which I have to be honest, they, they did a phenomenal job. It was really great work with all of them. Even the days when we had that 12 foot, 12 foot room with nine people in it with a table and other things, which was more of a challenge than anything. Thank you again, Alec, for that. It, it helps when you're trying to create a, um, just for all your filmmakers out there, future filmmakers, when you're trying to create a movie um, that, ha that you want to get a feeling of cla claustrophobia, my advice to you is don't hire a DP who is himself claustrophobic, <laughs> because <laughs> you'll never hear the end of it. <laughs> Nothing to do with that, man. <laughs> See, there's a reason we're on the opposite. They keep us separate. Um, we've just been spending uh, days and days and months together in the editing room. So um, I don't know if I if I can't stand her or or if I love him. Uh, does anybody have any uh, questions for us about t-shirts? <laughs> or the free, yes. Where? Uh, well, the, our story that takes place in the frozen Bering Sea was shot entirely in Chatsworth. <laughs> right next to the mattress warehouse. <laughs> we, we actually would scrounge like uh, cardboard tubes from the mattress warehouse, the rolls, uh, right, and spray them up and use them as our set. So, yeah, so we rented a little. I was told you can't, uh, you, you have to go find a ship. You, have to, that, you can't afford to build anything, you can, you're never going to do it. And I thought, I, I cut my teeth at Roger Corbin's, you know, mm -hmm. I can, I, we can do this. So, you know, if you have the right mindset and the right approach, and what we did was to, to bring our costs, because I knew that I couldn't shoot on a ship, because I have to cut holes through walls to get to, you know, to run puppet cables through and all that kind of stuff. And, um, and I wanted to own the environment. I wanted to have, you know, be in one big warehouse where we could just not worry whether the sun was coming up or down, you know, own, own the, where we shot. And, and how we brought the set construction cost down was we we, uh, we went online, Craigslist, and uh, you know, and, and we used our connections to get old uh, set flats. Like we got a bunch of sets from uh, behind the candelabra, the Liberace HBO thing, and we repurposed them. And if if there was a, an aspect of of the uh, it was a like kit bashing when you make a model spaceship, but kit bashing on a full scale. Size. And the chandeliers looked amazing <laughs> on the set. That was cool. It was all lit by candle. Do we see a nod to Leviathan in there? You'll see, if you don't see a nod to Leviathan, I haven't done my job. I <laughs> <laughs> love Leviathan. Yeah, we have some really great little um, in, uh, in, in jokes, or, you know, Easter eggs. We're trying to be respectful. I'm, I'm, you know, we're trying to do a movie that is, it's not a spoof, it's not a parody, um, but it knows that it is an homage. We're embracing uh, all the things we loved about those 80s movies. Um, you know, and that, that's really what the fans' mandate was. was, was uh, you know, I pitched that thing, they said yes. So the question is, like, I think everybody in this room is going to get that and love it. I don't know if the movie has, uh, you know, has a huge wide appeal. I personally think it does, because I think people are ready to see this kind of movie again. Yes. Um, but it'll yes. be sort of up to you guys to, to fuel the fire make people pay attention. Because we want to make more of these. We want to make more mo little, smaller movies. That, that we're not trying to build the universe. We're just trying to tell, tell contained stories. And I think that's part of the strength of what was going on in the 80s in horror. Was, uh, no, people weren't that. trying to make uh, movies that, you know, the universe, the fate of the universe, just, it was a microcosm of something larger. That's what we're trying to, trying to do. Was there another question? Uh, there's a lot of practical effects in this movie, which is fantastic. I was just wondering, in the horror genre, which is each one of yours favorite practical effect that really stood out? In, in, uh, in, in all horror? Genre. In all horror. Like, what special effect really stood out for all of you? I, I love H.R. Geiger's Alien. I think it's the most beautifully designed creature uh, in cinema history. And she's very disappointed that her dad screwed it up. <laughs> <laughs> well, come on. No, come on. We've worked on this. I worked on Aliens, thank goodness, but Alien 3, 4, AVP. 
the cut of the art question did start to slide. We did our best. We can't, can't hold back that avalanche. Sorry. I, I think when I think of this genre, I only think of practical effects. So there's a lot for me. I love Alien, obviously. Tremors was a big, I was a big fan. <laughs> yeah. Um, but I, I, I loved The Predator, I think. Especially the, when the mask came off and the jowls came out. That for me, I, I watched that movie so many times when I was a kid. I probably shouldn't have, but I watched it over and over and over. Uh, I can only pick one. The, mo the one that sticks with me at the youngest age is Alien, the, ch the uh, chestburster sequence. Uh, you know, I had never seen anything so visceral and, ah. Uh, <laughs> uh, that's, that's the one for me. I would have to say Harbinger Down is Target Rats. <laughs> yeah, of course. Harbinger Down is another one for all of us. We were thinking that. We're all thinking that. And, and, and seriously, for me, the reason why is to see it like, I mean, to see stuff when you're a kid and see how it's scary and then, you know, to see it happen, but then you look at the camera, or the, the, the footage that happens, and you're like, whoa. I mean, you see it on the, on the footage. It actually comes alive. And it's, that's amazing when you see that with monsters. You know? I think the, uh, in the practical effect, I think the entire section of the scene was in the thing when the doctor was doing CPR and the because yeah. you're completely taken out of thinking that anything's going to happen, all of a sudden the chest rips open and the guy's arms get lopped off. It wasn't the best effect with the arms, because you could see his body got thick all of a sudden. But <laughs> the effect within the film completely throws you, and that one really got me. Ben, I'm going to tell you that they hired an amputee. Yeah. <laughs> who, who wants it for me? Sorry. And they did a likeness makeup on the amputee. So. You think you must have put on weight thicker. Maybe. Possible. Oh, oh, oh. I think uh, you're going to fight. <laughs> any, any, uh, another question? Yes, sir. Uh, how long did it take to shoot? Jesus. Ben, why don't you answer that question? You had a camera. I think we wrapped yesterday. <laughs> well, we had yeah. 22 days of principal shooting, and then we went from second, third, fourth, fifth, sixth. We had a Las Vegas unit, seventh, eighth, and we just wrapped ninth last week, I believe, with the uh, on it, so it it total because you know when you're doing practical effects and you have to build stuff before you shoot, so shooting schedule kind of morphs into something a little bigger than that, I believe, when you're thinking about it day wise. This is still, from what Alec has told me, this has still been a shorter shoot schedule than most studio films have been for practical effects of this nature. Yeah, when we when we've done like uh, like an ABP movie, um, has about a 45 day shoot schedule. And we did that. There is a second unit, and even a third unit, and fourth unit. So there's a lot of shooting time. We uh, were budgeted to shoot uh, uh, 22 days, and then we had this other 10-day period that we were not strictly budgeted for, where everybody was like, where's the money going to come from to do this? And we were just like, uh, you just sort of say, uh, I don't know, we'll figure it out. And really, We'll sell t-shirts. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so we pulled it out of our contingency and all that, but my plan uh, was to just accept that I'm not going to get I'm not going to get a, a, a movie that I want shot in 22 days. So rather than you know just trying to set up puppets and creatures and all that stuff that eat up time while actors are sitting around, shoot the minimum that you need that is the connecting bits with them, and then detail stuff. Do that when you have four people, you know, and you've got and luckily everything's sort of smallish and intimate, you know, and it's like surgery, you know, and you get in there and you, and you get to tweak and, and play with. Them. And that's where the that's where the practical effects really come to life is in the second unit. But I, but I will say real quick on that, there uh, with the films he's talking about, there's a crew of thirty to forty. Um, it ended up being some of the units were me and Alec with the camera. I've been working so. I've been working at ADI sending out all the Kickstarter prizes all summer, and I can tell you that all summer, Ben, Alec, and Pat McClung, with, with <laughs> creating a little mini stage at ADI, filming filming most of the you know. Most of the effects that didn't include the actors. It's, it's, it's kind of yeah. It's kind of like you you shoot and then you're exhausted and you rest for a little while and then you gear up again and you shoot and you're exhausted and you keep doing that. But it is it is sort of like whittling down to the last few diehards. But we've had a great uh, a great level of. What's this rest thing? When does that happen? That's that's what I do. You're still oh. working. I, you're still. <laughs> this is the problem. Clarify where you, that one. Sorry. If you edit in your in your own house, you can't escape it. I get to go home. You don't. Uh, did you? Have, I was going to ask, when do you think it might be released? And in theater or on DVD? We 
are uh, aiming to have a finished film uh, right around Halloween. Ooh. Uh, we're in our best, last big push. But we're also, we also don't have domestic distribution yet, so uh, uh, I'm, I'm learning about the distribution game because I've been in the production trenches for years, so now it's, it's a very interesting process for me to learn and, and to learn, you know, how this, it's a crazy, it's a crazy aspect of movie making that is still kind of nebulous to me. But um, once we have our finished film, we'll be in a better position to get that. And whether or not it is theatrical, um, like I, having grown up as a film guy, you know, who only probably four years ago embraced even the idea of not shooting on film, but shooting digitally. Um, I have always been theatrical release minded. That is the end goal. And in terms of the, the eyeballs reached, um, it's not necessarily the end, end goal. It's not necessarily the best way to go. It's a much more expensive way to get a movie out. And if I look back at my own history, a movie like Tremors uh, didn't, not many people saw it in the theater, but tons of them saw it on DVD or videotape, right? So uh, <laughs> rentals back then. So what I would rather do is reach more people than know that my my movie is in a um, is in a is in a mall somewhere playing, you know, to to four people. Uh, uh, you know, filming in, during the summer, I always think like the film movies about the cold sub-zero in <laughs> the summertime. How did you guys deal with the weather? How did you create like the breath and the cold breath and the, the you know, Alaskan yeah. winter in Chatsworth? Well, well uh, uh, we, did, we did shoot in the winter in Chatsworth, which meant it was about 76 degrees. Oh. <laughs> But, but uh, what, and what Camille's talking about is that we have never, we haven't stopped shooting. We went right through the summer. But um, I'm going to let, uh, I know Ben is a huge enthusiast of practical uh, physical effects. So Ben, why don't you tell him about Frank Balzer? Oh, Frank. Uh, Frank Balzer was, uh, he was amazing. He was the one that came up with the snow, the breathing and everything. One of the uh, inventions he did was, uh, we used e-cigs. Was it vegetable oil? With vegetable oil. So all the actors have it tucked in their jackets, and they would take a hit real quick, and then they say their lines, and the camera would move off of them. They'd take another hit, and then they say their line again. So we were constantly having e-cigs around. He had rechargeable guys around, so. It Wait, was he a, told you there was vegetable oil in there? <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, I, to be honest, I, did, I never, I was a little too busy with other stuff to worry about that, but all I know is every time I turned around, one of them looked like they were hitting a bong at times. So uh, but it happened a lot where uh, he came up, he actually came up with that idea as far as I know. When we talked about I think he stole it, but you like it more than I do. Yeah. <laughs> anyway, he did, he did a phenomenal job. Freddie was, fantastic. was a one-man crew, actually, on the film. And, and he also did the snow effect. So he's like a freak about snow. This is why he was like, he contacted us. I got to do this movie because I love snow. And he had, you know, he, so he's got the snow technology down. Um, and uh, sometimes, it, it, um, you know, it just looks absolutely stunning. And then the way Ben lit it was beautiful. But I'll, I don't know, did you guys, were you guys okay breathing the E6? Oh, it was an interesting process because you can only take a certain amount. But you'd see the camera move off of you and you'd have it hidden in your glove. And you'd take another and then come back around and you'd keep going, you know. So it, it was definitely, uh, it would be funny, a funny outtake reel to like just see like these, these guys on the score. <laughs> Also, we had to keep, we were on a hot stage in Chatsworth <laughs> wearing big parkas and oh, yeah. smoking e-cigs. And, you know, we'd have to keep reminding ourselves, you know, if we came in from the deck into, you know, the ship, we had to remember that it was freezing cold out there. And I even get shirtless out on the deck at some point, ladies. <laughs> and men. Oh. Um, and uh, it was a hot shots were stage. No and, pressure. you know, we're trying to pretend like it's freezing. It's, uh, it was fun. And uh, in the trailer, it looks really cold. Actually, one of the things we just did recently, we shot the opening with Camille and Matt, and it literally was 105 in Chatsworth, and we were outside. Yeah. They had the e-cigs in their coats, and we're driving around. So, and it literally, it was, 100, it was the hottest day we had, it was about a week yeah. ago, wasn't Wearing it? Wearing the biggest winter coats. Right. Wow. <laughs> Our full winter looks, because we all had kind of like different, different layer, different layered and items, different versions of the same winter. But this one, we had our scarves and hats and big things and gloves. And because every time we warm. stopped, like, every time we'd say "cut," AC cranked on real quick in the van. We'd run for about a minute, turn it off, because we don't want the, the sound of it going on. But it was, it was, a, it was an interesting challenge to see this happen. And again, that was a two-man crew. 
It was you two, and me and Camille. Alex, the one who's like throwing the snow on us before the shots. <laughs> and he's got the boom. Yeah. yeah I, remember, I remember when I was, uh, I had a jacket constantly. I had to take the jacket off and sit in front of a fan. My shirt was soaking wet from sweat. And I was constantly just sitting in front of the fan. And I was like, all right, take the jacket off. How long do we have? <laughs> yeah, but that's okay. just him. He's got three layers on right now. Yeah, yeah. So. yeah, literally, I'm always hot. You know, 360 pounds, I can't help it. <laughs> <laughs> Any other questions? I was just wondering, because um, as actors, like when you guys, uh, especially for scary films, how do you get in that state of mind where you actually have to be scared of something that's not even there, or something that you know is fake, you know, and like, what's your state of mind that you go in to try and get yourself a good psych out? Well, there's an interesting part, I mean, one of the great things about working with practical effects is there's some stuff in this that you can't plan to react yeah. to. Yeah. There's no, yeah. you know, the, I think there's one day in particular where we were just all, reacting to what's in front of us. And, that, and that's a gift as an actor. If you're trying to figure out what you would be if this and that were happening, it puts you in a headspace which isn't necessarily the, the place to react from, which is what an actor should be doing. So I, I, think, I think the answer is to just lean on the people around you, know what's happening, and just trust what's, what's in your gut. I take a more scientific approach than that. Uh, I have a facial expression numbering system. Um, so I go through the script and, you know, I'll do a five, which is, you know, a surprise. And I'll just number the scenes. So for the scene where, where I had to be scared, I used a number three, an eight, and then I went to a twelve. Uh, it's easy to direct. They're like, no, 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 a two and a half, please. It's great. And they have a little thing on the stage so the director knows what all my expressions are. It's very similar to that pain chart in the hospital that goes from the all the way to the half. That's exactly that. Right. But that that was Matt's technique because some of the, somebody else on the on the in the crew had a uh, theirs was colors, so I had to remember like which color. And then and then Camille, her facial expressions were tied to dinosaurs, so I would shout out I would shout out orange for brontosaurus and magic. Someone else was playing Twister and it got very confusing. <laughs> Um, I have a question. Uh, did we figure out how to get the lights out here down? Oh, we could? So Ben could just get off the stage and set us up here? Why? Takes him a couple of minutes? Let's pull the trigger. Can we talk about out. Lance Henriksen for yeah, a second? Yeah, so let's talk Although about the question there. Oh, another question. Well, no, I just wanted to bring up our, our friends who are working on the film, the Scotia Shot. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Yes. Yeah. So, thank you very much. Um, so, you know, my... Uh, when I first uh, started the industry, uh, I was working for Roger Corman, and I had the honor of working with two guys, Robert and Dennis Skotek. And they are, uh, uh, they are my, as Stan Winston was my mentor for creature effects, Robert and Dennis uh, are my mentors for uh, miniature visual effects. So I worked with them in, in you know, building miniature sets on Battle Beyond the Stars, and Galaxy of Terror, and so on. I came away with this, they just opened my eyes to how things could be done. Um, so when this movie came around, I thought, I'm gonna get those guys, because they did Aliens, and you know Terminator 2, and Tremors, and The Abyss, and they, nobody does that tabletop stuff better than them. So I said to Robert at one point, when we had a miniature set, and we had a miniature puppet creature that was thrashing around and doing its thing, I said, this is, the first time I've stood on set with you, Robert, since we shot Tremors. And he said, you know what else? He said, the track over there that the camera is on is from Battle Beyond the Stars. Wow. <laughs> and I was like, it was just like coming full circle. So, um, so you'll see Robert's artistry uh, uh, all, all through this movie, uh, opening up the world. And, you know, and what, and what, uh, what I love about their miniature work is that it, it has a beautiful um, kind of, uh, it's got a tactile quality, but yet it's also got a, uh, a, a mood, a beautiful mood to it. And um, the other thing that we did to keep, uh, to keep our uh, continuity is that Ben Brown shot the miniature stuff. So he lit both the full scale and the miniature sets, and he lit the exterior, um, uh, you know, frozen seascape, and all that kind of stuff. I've just been very lucky to have the kind of support people all around me, you know, people that I've known for years, and 
step it up. And then also very fortunate that the fans have responded uh, as, as they have and, and, uh, and that we were able to pull this movie together on, on just an absolute shoestring. So, uh, anyway, I'm getting teary-eyed. Save me. In, uh, if you're not already, please find us on Facebook, Harbinger Down Official. Make sure it's the official page to get all the most up-to-date news, as well as on Twitter, Harbinger underscore down. Uh, and that way, we will, you'll, you'll be the first to know when we do get our distribution deal and whatever exciting things uh, begin to transpire. So. And you can actually do that right now with your smartphones. <laughs> Paige, we'll take a minute. Can we talk about Lance Henriksen? Yes, Speaking let's talk about Lance. Full circle, uh, Alec, you have a long history with that gentleman. I do. Matt's so good with this moderating stuff. I, thank you very much. Um, yeah, I do have a long history with that gentleman. Uh, I met him in uh, 1980, was it five? Uh, first thing I worked with him on was Aliens uh, with your father. And, and by the way, I remember one of my first jobs uh, at Stan Winston's was helping to go um, put up a basketball hoop for young 13-year-old uh, Matt Winston. And they um, weren't building monsters, they were building my dreams. dreams. <laughs> uh, and look at him now, he's in the NBA. Um, <laughs> Uh, but, you, you can be five foot nine and Jewish and forty four. <laughs> you can do it. But uh, uh, you know, and then, and then you know, we just became friends on that. Uh, I did the Bishop effect where he gets ripped in half, and so we were thrashing and putting, putting poor Lance through hell. And he still tells the story to this day about about how I, I, I grabbed the milk off. I ran out of milk products. I had my cooler. I had all this milk and yogurt and stuff for him to spew. Um, and of course, there's less. Uh, I think at that time. Anyway, less preservatives in uh, all the dairy products in England. So I ran out of stuff, which was in a cooler. I, I was doing due diligence. And then I grabbed it off the tea trolley, but the tea trolley had been sitting out for who knows how long. Oh, you know, yeah. that. So that night, he was up all night vomiting, and he came in the next day to finish the scene, and we had to put this stinky, sour clothing back on him. And he said, I just want to let you know you might want to double check uh, do a little sniff test before you. And I'm like, oh my God, I'm so sorry. And he said, no, 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 not a problem. And that's how Lance is. Uh, that's I, I, I was standing in a barn in, uh, a, 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 in Topanga Canyon on Pumpkinhead with these gigantic hard scleral lenses before there were soft scleral oh, lenses. Man. And I'm jamming these things into his eyes, you know. And now, of course, you'd have a lens tech who actually knew what they were doing. And I dropped it into the dust, and I'm like, oh, and I look at Lance, he says, just wash it off and shove it in. <laughs> Words to live by. So, 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 Lance is an absolute trooper, and he's been, he's been after me and Tom to get something going and get him in it and direct something. And, you know, John Woo set me on fire at Heart Target. <laughs> Whatever you want, buddy. You know, so that's that's the guy he is. He is, he is that's the guy. And, and he came on board for the Kickstarter process. So it was this wasn't something where you know once we're ready to shoot, Lance was there from the very beginning. Yeah. You know, making yeah. videos, talking to people, getting people excited about this project. So we had a room for him in our in our little crappy little warehouse in uh, Chatsworth, temporary. You know, we rented it. Um, it was one room that we had dedicated. We put his name on it because he's the big. He's the star, the star of the movie. And all the other actors just had to like have this common area. And Lance sees it, and he's like, he was totally embarrassed. And he ripped it down and he put up a sign, wrote it, wrote on it. Everybody <laughs> except <laughs> Steve. I, everyone except Steven, he said. <laughs> <laughs> well, so Lan Lance was uh, honestly when he showed up on set and uh, I remember in that galley scene when he's there and we're all in the same room. It was we all I, I know I was feeling like, oh, okay. We got something great here. You know, I loved and trusted Alec, of course, but uh, Lance has such gravity and uh, such credibility in this genre. And he really was the, the core of, of the, the crew, the fake crew and the real crew. I mean, he and, he and Alec together really uh, sort of set the tone. And, you know, Lance is one of the busiest actors working, and he came down and, you know, this was a labor of love for him, too. His days, uh, his days off, he was there. Yep. First one there, last to leave. He wasn't shooting that day. He didn't matter. Yeah. He's there. He he'll, he'll come down in a, a day's notice to sign posters if we run out of sign posters for Kickstarter prizes. Make videos for the fans. He's so involved and proud of the project. The only thing he won't do is show up today. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, he he was he was deeply apologetic at, at 
wanted to make sure everybody knew. He said, tell him I, I wouldn't do it if I wasn't working, but it's this thing that changed the schedule. So, uh, how long did you put the uh, basketball net for Matt this time? <laughs> um, yeah, oh, yeah, the, he did require that. Matt needed that. He was like, oh, Alec, I need another basket every day. It was some new sporting equipment that I had to, I had to <laughs> assemble for him. I need to come in early before we shot. You have four minutes out. No, you don't. You have 15, 14 minutes. 14 um, minutes. You have, how long is the trailer uh, going to take? Three, four? Three or four minutes. So you have about ten minutes of I, talking. Uh, okay. I would, I, would like to, uh, I would like to show you guys the trailer. Would you like to see the trailer again? Yes. A little louder, a little... Woo! Yes. Okay. All right. Here, let's just move our uh, chairs away. And then maybe it will inspire more questions. Or maybe not. Maybe we'll all just like... Hey. <laughs> yeah, you can give me. Oh, that's true. Have a hey, circle. okay. Here's here's a thought. Uh, we are. This is probably the last trailer we're going to be able to put out, right? The first trailer, as I mentioned, was sort of monster centric, right? Because we wanted to like hit everybody and go, look, we did it. We got monsters. That's what you wanted. We go. So now this is intended to sort of, you know, class. We got to start thinking about appealing beyond the, you know, our family of monster creatures. So um, we're looking to sort of establish mood, uh, performance, uh, and, and open the world up a little bit with including the shots of the ships and so on and so forth. So what I'd like to do is um, have you guys watch it, and then I'm going to ask you sort of focus groupy stuff if you have thoughts about it. Because we're going to release it on, on October 3rd, but Ben doesn't have anything to do. He can recut it as many times <laughs> as you guys like. So let's, uh, let's roll it.